Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong and fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication, with divine recompense. He comes to save you. Are your hearts frightened? That is, are they anxious, concerned, weighed down with care? The people in the gospel, the people of the Decapolis, their hearts are frightened. They're weighed down with care for their brother who is deaf and mute. That's why they bring him to the Lord and they beg for God to heal him. They beg Jesus, please heal this man. Heal this deaf and mute man, our brother. And Jesus steps into their reality. He comes to them just as the prophet Isaiah said. Here is your God. He comes with vindication, with divine recompense. He comes to save you. Jesus has come. And Jesus heals him, right? He says to him, be opened. He touches him and makes him whole again. But he does it in this personal way, right? It's not right there in front of the crowd. He takes him off to the side. He doesn't just make it an impersonal thing. It's very personal. Jesus speaks to him one-on-one and then touches him. And he heals him for a purpose. This isn't like going to a hospital and getting well again. You just go back out and go back to living like normal. This encounter with Christ that heals him isn't supposed to be something that then leaves him back to lead life as it was. He has to change. He's encountered Christ in a radical way that he can't possibly conceive of living life the same afterwards. And that's God's purpose in healing him. When God heals him, when God opens his mouth, when the Lord opens his ears, he is now able to hear the gospel and to proclaim it. Because what does he do? And what do all the other people do who saw this? They go around proclaiming, he has done all things well. He has made the deaf hear and the mute speak. Even though Jesus told them, stop saying that. Stop talking about that. They were so filled with the wonder of it, they had to tell everybody. They are now become participators in Christ's mission. They have become disciples, right? Sent forth with the mission to proclaim the word of God. That's the recompense. That's what God has repaid them with. He's given them the opportunity to become his disciples. It's not something we often think about as a gift to be disciples of the Lord. But it is. To be united with him in his redemptive mission, that's amazing. When we get to participate in that, participate in the spiritual healing of others, in proclaiming the gospel, That's a gift, that's a privilege that not everybody in the world has. So let's fast forward, 1800 years later, people whose hearts are frightened, the people of France during the French Revolution. Why do I bring this up? Today is the 174th anniversary of the death of the founder of the Fathers of Mercy, Father Jean-Baptiste Rosan. So I'm gonna talk about him a little bit because he's my founder and I love him. People whose hearts are frightened during the French Revolution are looking for God to come to them, especially the faithful, those who have remained Catholic despite all the atheist, liberal violence that has taken over the streets through the reign of terror, the persecution of Catholics, of religious, of priests, the martyrdom of thousands of priests and religious. Everybody's frightened. The faithful are looking for God to come to them, for God to come bring healing, for him to restore the church in France. And God does. He does it through several holy priests that he inspired to begin to preach again after peace, relatively speaking, comes back to France after Napoleon starts reigning. One of those priests was Father Rosan, who in Lyon founded the Fathers of Mercy and began to preach missions to bring back fallen away Catholics to, with the same message that our Lord preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And his missionaries, the Fathers of Mercy, carried out that preaching and spiritual healing, especially through the sacrament of confession. And so their message was that message of recompense, of divine vindication. Be strong and fear not, they could say to the faithful, for your God comes to you. Be strong, fear not, don't fear anymore the violence. If you're martyrs, you earn heaven. Trust in divine providence though, God is going to restore the church. And he eventually did so, even though it took time. For the repentant, God will forgive you. That's your recompense. When you come back to the church after having been part of the revolution, part of the atheism, part of the radical liberalism that was rampant in France at the time, if you come back, what's your recompense? God's not going to punish you. He's going to forgive you. That's your vindication. He will welcome you back with open arms. But for the unrepentant, the recompense of God, what will God repay them with? That's a fearful thing to think about. And even as they're preaching to the crowds, there are personal encounters which stand out for them. One, which I like to think about, has always struck me, was a mission in Strasbourg um, on the border of France and Germany in 1825. And it was a town filled with Protestants and a rather large military garrison. And while they were preaching this mission, the soldiers of the garrison were coming to the cathedral of Strasbourg every night for, to hear the mission talks. But they had a curfew, because they were military, and they had to go back to the barracks every night before the mission ended. And they were so frustrated by this that they went to their chief, um, their general, and asked for something to be done. Can you speak to the missionaries for us? We want to attend the whole mission. And he did. He went to Father Rosan, who was heading up that 1825 mission and asked if this could be done. And they did. They set aside eight days of the mission specifically for the military garrison and all 4,000 men, 4,000 men who had served under Napoleon, who had fought in the revolution, who had marched halfway across Europe, conquering countries with the emperor. These 4,000 men came every night to the mission. These 4,000 men came every night to hear the word of God preached, to seek reconciliation. They came with repentance. In fact, the general, the head of the garrison, General Lige Belair, was one of those who would come in last, but he would walk up the center aisle of the church all the way to the front to sit down as an example to his men. And there is, he was pretty old at the time, he went to confession and towards the end of the mission on his knees on the cold stone floor and it was so painful he was sweating and tearing up and the missionary said, well, just sit down and he said, no, this has to be done this way because he wanted to do penance for his sins and he made the rest of his confession still on his knees although he did allow them to place a book under his knees for comfort. Just like the blind and deaf man these people who had fallen away from the church came back to it. They allowed their hearts to be opened again to the gospel and became, if not by word, then by, at least by example, with General Lige Belair, at least by example became proclaimers again of the word of God to proclaim how important the Christian faith was. They became, in that sense also, participators in the mission of Christ they shared again in his redemptive, salvific work. So, are your hearts frightened? Are you anxious, concerned, filled with care today? In the midst of the politics of the world, maybe, looking at what's going on in our country, looking at what's going on abroad. Maybe it's about yourself. Maybe it's about your own inadequacy or weakness, or inability to become the better person that you would like to be. Maybe it's about your health in the midst of the uh, ravaging Delta strain. Are your hearts frightened? Now, I'm not the preacher that Father Rosan was, and I'm, not near the, and I'm not the prophet Isaiah, and I'm not Christ, right? But I can repeat Isaiah's words, be strong and fear not, for your God comes with vindication 
with divine recompense, he comes to save you. At baptism, the priest touched your lips and your ears and said, may he soon, referring to Christ, touch your ears to receive his word and your mouth to proclaim his faith. Through Christ, through the minister, through the priest, Christ touched you at your baptism. He healed you of that heinous, heinous, grievous wound of original sin and made you able to hear his word with an open heart and to proclaim it with pure lips. He made you participators in his redemptive salvific mission at your baptism. And today, you have heard his word, right? And in a few moments, you're going to receive him in the Holy Eucharist on your tongue, in your mouth. And then you're going to go forth to proclaim that same word to the nations. That's your recompense. That's your vindication. Is the very word of God and the body and blood of Christ. Isn't that amazing? That's something that filled with gratitude, we should be able to go out and proclaim to all the world. We don't want to be like the people that St. James is writing to, the Christians that he's writing to. And he says, why are you making distinctions among yourselves, putting down the poor, raising up the rich? Why are you judging others with evil intent? You're supposed to be better than that. We're all supposed to be better than that. We're all called to be like Christ in not doing that. So we can imitate, not just Christ, but also the blind and deaf, not blind, the deaf mute man who was healed in the gospel today. He doesn't judge others. He doesn't go around saying, Jesus touched me, not you. No, he goes around saying, he has done all things well. We want to say, Jesus has done all things well. He continues to do all things well in my life and he can do it in yours. He's made me, who was deaf and mute, able to hear and to speak. Come to him. This is what you're supposed to say to others. Come to him, that he might also heal you.